Uh, welcome back, everybody, to, uh, to our first session. Uh, we have a truly distinguished panel here um, uh, for our first session. Um, this, is, this session is uh, designed to uh, um, bring together perhaps the most experienced uh, members uh, in both our governments uh, in terms of the alliance relationship. And I think this would be a great opportunity to hear about their experience, but also to have an interaction with the, with the, uh, with the audience. So we'll do a quick round uh, and then uh, try to open up to the audience as, as quickly as possible. <clears throat> but of course, before we start, allow me to introduce our, our panelists uh, very briefly. Uh, to my immediate left is Dr. Han Sung Ju. Uh, he's a professor emeritus at Korea University. For those of you uh, who know anything about uh, the, our bilateral relations and about Korea, he's, he's most, one of the most respected figures in terms uh, of our foreign policy, intellectual community, and also in terms of, uh, of, of the uh, uh, practitioner. He was, our, um, he was a professor of international relations at Korea University for many years, having trained many of the best minds uh, foreign policy experts in, in Korea. Over the years, he was our ambassador to the United States, uh, our minister of uh, foreign affairs, uh, especially during uh, uh, the first uh, North Korean uh, nuclear crisis. He was also um, served as a member of the UN inquiry mission on the 1994 Rwanda genocide and served as UN Secretary General Special Representative uh, to Cyprus. Please give him a warm round of welcome. Uh, uh, next is uh, 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 Secretary William Cohen. Um, doesn't need much introduction. Uh, he's, he, was a th he served three terms as Senator of, of, of Maine. Uh, he was former Secretary of Defense under President Bill Clinton. He is currently the uh, Chairman and CEO of the Cohen Group and he serves on the boards of the U.S.-China Business Council and the U.S.-India Business Council. And he's also a very frequent visitor uh, to, to Korea and a good friend of Korea. So also please give him a round of applause. Um, to his left is Dr. Pak Jin, who is currently the executive president of Asia Future uh, Institute. He's, uh, He's an endowed chair professor at the Graduate School of International Area Studies at Hanguk University of Foreign Studies. Uh, he served three terms in Korea's uh, National Assembly um, and was the chairman of the Foreign Affairs, Trade and National Unification Committee of the National Assembly. Again, please give him a wall. Last but le not least, uh, to my far left is General B.B. Uh, Bell. Burwell B. Bell. He's the retired United States Army four-star uh, general. He is the former commander of the United Nations Command, Combined Forces Command, and the United Forces Korea, uh, forces in Korea, as well as the United States Army, Europe, and NATO's land component uh, headquarters. He's a veteran of the Iraq Desert Storm campaign, uh, and he's, he's a constant and one of the most uh, convincing uh, advocate for continued security relations, tight security relations between our two countries. Thank you, General, for coming. Thanks, Please give them um, So what I'd like to uh, ask all of our panelists, uh, starting with Dr. Han Sung-ju, is to, is to uh, give us your reflection and really a, a summary of your view of the alliance, where it has been. Uh, where it is now and where, where you think it should be going. So this is a very broad mandate. Uh, please, Dr. Han. Thank you. As uh, some of you may know, I still carry with me a souvenir from the Korean War in the form of uh, a shrapnel from, uh, uh, I guess, uh, U.S. artillery mm -hmm. at the time of the recapture of Seoul on September 28, 1950. Uh, this story was written by David Sanger, who will be here in the afternoon in the New York Times. But um, at that time, the uh, U.S. and uh, 
Korean forces, South Korean forces, trying to recapture Seoul after landing in Incheon, uh, was uh, bombing in the vicinity, vicinity of Seoul, and uh, I was struck by a shrapnel, which hit me on my hip, uh, which I still, uh, and, and the shrapnel I still carry with me, uh, at the risk of uh, triggering the uh, metal detector at airports. Uh, <laughs> But uh, if it had been about an inch higher, um, I probably would not be here today. In the um, post-World War II period, the United States formed alliances with various countries in Europe, Asia, and Oceania as a means of building a network of military cooperation in the course of implementing what was known as the containment policy vis-à-vis the Soviet Union. Despite the ending of the Cold War, most of the alliances formed by the United States in the post-World War II period have survived for over six six decades. What were the specific reasons for the United States' decision to enter into alliance with South Korea? In addition to containing the Soviet expansion, the United States, through the alliance, aimed at preventing another invasion of North Korea, aimed at prevent, uh, uh, defending Japan, making South Korea a showcase for democracy and development, where the United States sacrificed tens of thousands of lives and spent billions of dollars and helping persuade President Syngman Rhee, who wanted to march to North for reunification to accept the Korean armistice. For South Korea, in addition to deterring North Korea, it wished to build and strengthen its own defensive capability and maximize U.S. economic assistance. Sixty years after the formation of the alliance, the original rationale for the alliance has clearly undergone changes. Nonetheless, why are the Republic of Korea and the United States still trying to maintain and indeed strengthen the alliance? For the United States, the original purpose of maintaining checks and balances among the major powers remains valid. North Korea continues to be a security threat now with the added elements of nuclear and missile capabilities. The need to help defend Japan through alliance with the Republic of Korea still remains germane. At the same time, peace and security in Korea are also consistent with the economic interest of the United States. South Korea needs the alliance not only for defense and deterrence vis-a-vis North Korean armed forces, but also to cope with the threats of weapons of mass destruction and bellicose policies. In the past, we did not always agree 100% on how to deal with North Korea. Twenty years ago, I served as South Korea's foreign minister in the early 1990s when the U.S.'s Clinton administration held a more positive view regarding negotiating with North Korea, then President Kim Jong-sam of South Korea. Ten years ago, I served as Korea's ambassador in Washington during the first term of President George W. Bush, who took it a much harder line toward North Korea than his Korean counterpart. In both cases, my main task was to bridge that gap and coordinate the two allies' policies and positions. Fortunately, at present, the Allies seem to be on the same page on how to deal with North Korea, what with its provocations and weapons of mass destruction programs. Even as the Allies now concentrate on deterring North Korea's military threat, denuclearizing North Korea and managing peace on the Korean Peninsula, from a longer-term perspective, the alliance should contribute to bringing about peaceful unification of the Korean Peninsula and building peace in the Northeast Asian region. More specifically, it needs to do the following. 
One, while deterring war, the alliance should induce strategic change in North Korea and cooperate towards stability and peace on the Korean Peninsula and ultimately its unification. Two, it should be made clear that the complete resolution of the North Korean nuclear situation is a precondition for peace and stability. Three, the ROK-U.S. alliance should go beyond its focus on traditional security threats with a view to pursuing universal values such as freedom, human rights, democracy, and market economy. The alliance should mature into a cooperative partnership not only for the Korean Peninsula but also for the Asia-Pacific region and the world as a whole. And finally, the normative underpinning for the ROK-US alliance is liberal democracy. Based on the shared value of liberal democracy, both the ROK and the US should address and work on common agendas such as human rights, environmental protection, human trafficking and stopping piracy, counterterrorism, non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, etc. In conclusion, the most important accomplishment of the U.S. ROK alliance has been that for six decades, it has served as anchor for stability, security, and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula, in the Asia-Pacific region, and increasingly around the world. The alliance has grown. It began primarily as the security alliance, which has, over the decades, blossomed into partners for prosperity, stability, and democracy. Korea became America's seventh largest trading and trading country in the world and U.S.'s FTA partner. Now it's an increasingly global partnership about what we can do to, together for the region and the world. In sum, it has grown to be a comprehensive strategic alliance based on common values and mutual trust. At age 60, the alliance has every reason to celebrate what it has ac accomplished and to grow further and to blossom more fully. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Well, I could just uh, yep. forego speaking and endorse everything you've just said. <laughs> but. Uh, Unfortunately for you, I have three or four minutes uh, to try and uh, give you some personal recollections. First, let me congratulate you on the video that was shown at the beginning of the, uh, the program. I think it summarized everything uh, that needs to be said and uh, that we can all say and, and, uh, and emphasize again. But I remember uh, the focus you had on the uh, Korean War Memorial. Uh, this is in honor of our sons and daughters who answered the call uh, of duty to defend a country they didn't know and a people they had never met. Uh, in uh, fact, I had never been to Korea or had met Korean people before 1979. And I traveled in 1979 and uh, along with three of my Senate colleagues and we met with President Park, whose daughter is now president as well. And he was concerned at that time that uh, President uh, J Jimmy Carter was planning to reduce at least 5,000 uh, troops from, uh, from South Korea as a signal uh, to the north. President Park said this would be a very bad signal. It would signal uh, weakness uh, and perhaps the beginning of a withdrawal from the U.S. forces from the region. Uh, we took that message, went back uh, to the White House. We met with President Carter uh, and persuaded him uh, that this was the wrong thing to do at this time. And to his credit, uh, he, uh, he accepted our recommendation, overruled a campaign pledge that he had made. Uh, and I sometimes cynically uh, say to presidential candidates, first, make no promises during the campaign. And number two, <laughs> if you make them, be sure you break them. Uh, because uh, many times presidential candidates make commitments that uh, once they get into the Oval Office, they find that they were unrealistic and unwise. Uh, but President Carter did overrule his own campaign pledge. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, the troops stayed and stability was maintained. I fast forward to 2008, and I was sitting uh, in uh, Seoul uh, at a meeting with um, various former heads of state. And I was sitting at a table with a series of uh, cabinet officers. 
And one of them had turned to me and said, you know, this is a week before our election back in 2008. He said, if, um, if Barack Obama gets elected president of the United States, uh, to Dick Cheney's chagrin, I might add, <laughs> um, as we uh, heard this morning. But he said, if uh, Obama gets elected uh, president of the United States, it'll be, and he used these exact words, the ratification of the American dream, which I thought was an interesting way that he phrased it. And I said, why do you say that? He said, because if you can take a first-generation African-American becomes president of the United States, then anything is possible. And I said, that's true, but it's not just an American dream. Uh, it's every country's dream. It's every person's dream. And it's a Korean dream. And we talked about this morning and listened uh, to you re referring it to a miracle. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, H.K. Park, who's in the uh, audience, I think, today, uh, reminds me that the phrase is frequently used, uh, miracle on the Han. Mm -hmm. That somehow that's uh, an not inappropriate, but an uh, inaccurate statement because a miracle implies the work of a higher authority. Uh, and of course, there is a higher authority in the universe, but the miracle, uh, if you use that phrase, is inappropriate because it was really the South Korean people who built the country that is there today. It's the people who invested their time and energy and intellect into building uh, the first class companies in, in the world in electronics and construction and shipbuilding uh, and automobiles. So, or who have uh, produced a democracy which has uh, the first woman president uh, in, uh, in South Korea. So not miracle, but uh, really industry, integrity, dedication that has produced uh, this uh, country that is now um, the third, 13th largest economy in the world. Think about that from the, the total devastation that took place 60 years ago to become uh, one of the top nations in the world economically. That's uh, truly astonishing. Uh, I also found myself uh, in much of the agreement of what uh, Vice President and former Vice President Cheney was saying today in terms of my concerns about what is taking place as far as our military capability, because I think the sequester, which has now become almost seen as the new normal, has very uh, dangerous long-term consequences for the United States. And I do recall that uh, even though Vice President Cheney was critical of the Obama administration. I thought that the decision to send B-2 bombers and F-22 aircraft uh, to uh, Korea recently to send a signal uh, to the North Koreans to begin with, uh, but also to the South Koreans that this is the capability we're prepared to bring in the event that Kim Jong-un doesn't climb down off the tree on which he was cutting off every rhetorical limb uh, and thereby uh, creating a very, very dangerous condition uh, that the United States was prepared to send whatever we have in our inventory to defend uh, the South Korean people. And so the flight of those B-2s and F-22s and accelerating our deployment of uh, air defense uh, systems to Guam, etc., very important to the South Koreans who may have become a bit apprehensive, as we talked about a moment ago, about uh, seeing those uh, aircraft come. But it was a good signal to the North Koreans, to the Japanese as well, that we have their backs uh, in the region and especially to the Chinese. So I think that uh, when we talk about the security commitment, and of course our relationship goes much deeper than simply security, free trade agreement, promoting uh, democracy, shared sacrifice of uh, the ROC forces in um, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, peacekeeping in, uh, in Lebanon and elsewhere, uh, that this relationship has matured. It's much more than just a security relationship, but that security relationship is fundamental not only to the security of South Korea, but to the entire peninsula and to the entire region. And as was discussed earlier, because of the proliferation threat posed by North Korea, it can become a global uh, destabilizer as well. So uh, this relationship is fundamental to security. And as we all know, when there is security in a region, uh, it has the opportunity to prosper because capital will invest. And if it's in unstable, then, cop uh, then uh, capital will take flight. Uh, and so our presence in the region and the symbol of our commitment and the substance of our commitment has to remain strong. And so to the extent that uh, Vice President Cheney talked about a weakening 
of the U.S. military capability over time is not happening just yet, but if the current trend continues and you have, in essence, a, uh, a linking of the far right on the Republican side of isolationism with the far left on the Democratic side, which is looking for a way to get at the defense budget, so to speak, then you have them linking hands with people in the middle who have been the internationalists, then I think there's cause for concern. So my hope is that as we work our way through our budgetary difficulties, that we will understand the consequences of, of cutting a budget in a way that really isn't consistent with a strategic objective, but simply uh, is an across-the-board, mindless um, action of uh, uh, budgetary extremism in, in terms of how we're dealing with it. So uh, the relationship is strong. It has endured, to use the phrase you used uh, earlier. Uh, it will endure uh, as long as the United States remains committed and remains strong. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Secretary. Dr. Park Jin. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Ham, for inviting me to attend this uh, conference, very timely uh, and very prestigious gathering of all those who um, are interested in promoting the Korea-U.S. alliance. Um, I don't have a shrapnel in my body because I was born after the Korean War, um, but I'm a product of the war. My parents came down to the south during the war. They met in Busan and uh, came up to Seoul and settled down, and I was born in Seoul. So as a product of the Korean War, I'm very honored to be here to talk about the future of our Korea-U.S. alliance. Uh, talking about the alliance, I think that uh, we have managed our relationship fairly well. Uh, we have had some troubled times and different views or frictions or uh, misunderstandings, but I think that overall this is one of the most successfully operating uh, alliance in the history of the world. Um, uh, people talk about democracy and market economy, and I think that's right. I mean, these are the important aspects of our alliance, but uh, the more fundamental values that we have been trying to uh, protect is a respect for human, human life and respect for human dignity and also respect for um, human uh, rights. Uh, and that, I think, should be the, really the bedrock uh, of our alliance for the next 60 years. And these are the values that would distinguish Korea-U.S. alliance from Korea-China relationship. Uh, if, I, if I can tell you an episode about this humanitarian aspect about bondage. Even before the alliance, alliance was born in 1950, December, you may remember the great rescue operation uh, from Hungnam, the evacuation of the North Korean people chased by the you know, sea of human wave of the Chinese uh, soldiers. Uh, to be carried over on a commercial ship called Victory Meredith, which could accommodate only 2,000 people. And it was not a passenger vehicle. Uh, but then the, the captain decided to take as many North Korean people as possible to escape uh, from the uh, battlefield and to provide a new freedom to these people. And he got 14,000 of people on board. And during three days of voyage, none of them um, died, and also five new babies were born on board. And the captain didn't know what to do with these five children on board. So he gave the name Kimchi 1, Kimchi 2, <laughs> Kimchi 3, Kimchi 4, <laughs> Kimchi 5. And I met one of them, Kimchi 5, in a small island called Koje, who is a veterinarian. He takes care of all the troubled animals in the island now. Um, and he told me graphically about the situation, which he doesn't remember, but his father remember very well. Uh, and now, I think he's trying to visit the United States and bring this vessel back to Koje Island mm. to tell people about the living examples of the humanitarian spirit and the respect for human, human life uh, that was given by the United States captain of the ship, uh, who, who passed away, by the way, so he's coming to the U.S. to meet with the bereaved families of this captain. And I think that this is an episode, not just an episode, but the fundamental values of why we have been maintaining our alliance for the last 60 years. And also this is the energy 
which is a renewable energy, mm -hmm. in my view, to carry over to the next six decades of our alliance. South Korea has now become the leading democracy in Asia. According to The Economist, this is a British um, uh, <clears throat> journal, they produce the democracy index every year. Uh, and I keep watching the result of this yearly assessment of democracies in Asia. They say uh, globally, democracy has advanced in the Middle East because of the Arab Spring and also in Asia, and particularly in Korea. Korea now ranks as the 20th country among the 25 full democracies in Asia, even ahead of Japan. So whether we agree or not, Korea represents the vibrant democracy in Asia. And I think that's because of the great contribution made by the alliance between Korea and the United States in the military, security, and political partnership, uh, and also um, economic companionship. Uh, in the military area, I know General Bell uh, knows much more about this relationship than me. I think we have had a most successful deterrence against the North Korean security threat. And we have been very successful in preventing another war from occurring in the Korean Peninsula. That itself, I think, is a great achievement that we have made uh, during the 60 years of our alliance. Secondly, in economic uh, area, uh, Korea could concentrate on national development because of the security support from the United States. Uh, and also now, uh, through the Korea-US FTA, uh, you know, we are having an excellent uh, economic partnership through the increase of trade and investment uh, and also promotion of the service industry and now the energy uh, industry also I think is a very important area to upgrade our economic collaboration between the two countries. We do have some uh, concerns uh, about global economic crisis and financial difficulties uh, and the Eurozone crisis and so on. But the fact that Korea maintains FTA with the United States uh, is a kind of protecting uh, Korea from the impact of the global uh, negative economic development. So this is a very important strength uh, of our alliance and also for the Korean economy and for that matter for the U.S. economy as well. In political partnership, we have had tough times, as Secretary Cohen mentioned, the story of the U.S. troops withdrawal under Carter administration. Uh, South Korea reacted uh, uh, in, in, a, in a very angry way, uh, and then uh, there were some tensions erupting between the two sides. But finally, because of the decision made by the U.S. government, we could manage our conflict uh, in, a, in a very productive way. We have had a uh, difficult times when the two schoolgirls were killed by the American vehicles uh, and the anti-American sentiment was uh, ignited uh, at the center of, uh, of Seoul. Uh, still, and I think that we tried our best um, um, means possible to manage this conflict and to move towards more open, transparent, and more perceptive uh, alliance uh, for the future. Uh, so I think that overall, we have had a very successful alliance and the fundamental values which we try to protect is a respect for human life, human dignity, and human rights, which will be carried over to the next six decades of our future alliance. Thank you very much, Dr. Hupton. Uh, General? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hom, for this opportunity. Terrific words of everybody. I'll kind of wrap it up. <laughs> I will say that, uh, Mr. Secretary, you mentioned the miracle on the Han. If, if I seem a little passionate about Korea, it's because my miracle in Korea, in addition to the, the improbable reality that I had a chance to command uh, the combined forces over there, is my granddaughter, Jen Hee Bell, who is of Korean ancestry, and she is a miracle. <laughs> she is the number one granddaughter in the world. <laughs> All of you alls are second. So when I go through here, I admit a grand prejudice. I admit the enormous passion, and I make uh, great uh, light over that. Let me, I, I jotted down a few remarks because I want to make sure I cover a couple things, and I, I will not exceed my five minutes. We talk about 60 years of this alliance, uh, but uh, go back, if you will, a little bit and recognize, I think, that for many Koreans today, uh, that 60 years has really been a story of over 100 years 
of occupation, annexation, war, division, family displacement, uncertainty, instability, and the constant threat of renewed hostilities and confrontation. It's a story of a people being surrounded on the west, on the north, and indeed on the east in their minds. And it's a story, of course, of great grit, perseverance, bravery, love, commitment, personal and national pride, as we've said, stunning economic accomplishment and entrepreneurial achievement. And for those same hundred years, uh, if we want to pick a good round number, the United States has been in the Korean security equation, let there be no doubt, mostly from a perspective of being a very staunch ally, even though, and I'll discuss it, our approach during the first half of the 20th century can only be described, in my view, as problematic. And, of course, Dean Acheson's uh, famous or infamous 1950s speech for the National Press Club in this very town, wherein he defined our early Cold War defensive perimeter, is still viewed by many Koreans as surely giving strong impetus to uh, to Pyongyang and to Moscow to initiate hostilities uh, to reunite the peninsula as a communist state. Whether that's all true or not, and it's certainly debatable, lots of books have been written, perceptions count. And that is a perception. One thing is for sure in my view that for the past 60 years, the United States and the South Korean uh, Treaty Security Alliance has been resolute and absolute, rock solid, and more so surely than any other security treaty in the history of the world at this point. Whether on the uh, peninsula itself, and others have said this, or in an incredibly <coughs> strong alliance around the world, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Kosovo, Iraq, Afghanistan. I met my first Korean officer during an earthquake in Kosovo, believe it or not, when I asked him in a dining facility, why is this building rattling? And he said, sir, this is obviously an earthquake. Let's run. And I did. <laughs> what a great officer. And we did, too. <laughs> but trust Crossing, we went outside where we should have been. Uh, The the two allies, whether on the peninsula or around the world, have stood firm with their military motto of kachi kachi da, um, we go together. And today, the stakes could not be any higher. South Korea's economy, of course, is thriving, as everyone knows, and it's a major engine for world economic energy. Evidence my Samsung 3 Galaxy here (laughs) and all the other products that come out of the great Republic of Korea. It's really a terrific phone. I got to get a four. I got to get a four. I got to do it. But the old pressures remain. Uncertainty all around the world, mostly from an increasingly belligerent and now dangerously nuclear armed North Korea. We must assume right now that North Korea has operational capability. Um... Whether they have an intercontinental missile or not, and whether they've miniaturized is not the point. They can put a bomb in an airplane and drop it within range wherever they want to. So if you're a South Korean, they have operational capability. Uh, If you're an American, you can mince words about uh, ICBMs if you want. But that nuclear capability is a game changer. Um, With that in mind, of course, to the West, there's a rising China. Uh, asserting itself regionally. Russia's in the background, but uh, for sure, but gaining strength and influence even in that region. And of course, unfortunately, there's the age-old bickering between uh, good friends to the east in Japan uh, that is not yet resolved and which um, certainly North Korea plays to the hilt. So to achieve continuing stability and prosperity, now is not the time for the United States government to send any signal of change in commitment, the slightest signal of lessened commitment, no matter how unintended, remember perceptions matter, the slightest signal of lessened commitment can and will be misinterpreted in Pyongyang, in Beijing, in Seoul, and yes, right here in Washington, D.C. In my view, the United States must firmly inform all the parties in the the region that as long as we are welcome and wanted by the Republic of Korea, the United States is there to stay, and that that area represents vital national interests for the United States, and those interests are at stake. This is why I've dramatically changed, for me at least, my position on the issue of OPCON transfer. 
It is not about the incredibly effective South Korean military and the competency of its generals and its admirals. This is without question. It is about and solely about a nuclear armed North Korea where our promise of extended deterrence and a nuclear um umbrella will not be good enough if we are seen as backing away from this alliance in any way, shape, or form. We have to be in it. We have to lead it to retain the confidence that we are willing to win it. The United States should not signal that it's backing away from its security of commitments uh, or its guarantees, as I've said, in even the slightest way. This is, in my view, our Atchison moment of 2013. We must be careful. Leading from behind is a dangerous cliché in the world of Northeast Asia security. We must retain, therefore, OPCON of combined forces in wartime as long as there is a nuclear-armed North Korea and an unhelpful China opting for continued status quo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, very quickly, one, one, one more round. Um, all of you have mentioned and have actually lived through a very difficult period in, in, in the alliance, uh, despite what, what, uh, what, where we are now. And maybe it's perhaps because we have been through uh, the, those difficult times that we are able to be where we are. But what do you think is in the future? If there's something that one thing or a couple of things that you, comes to mind that we need to avoid, given your experience in, in the difficulties in the bilateral relationship, what do you think would be some of the factors that we need to be on the watch out, look out for? Dr. Park. Yep. Um, I agree with um, General Bell that the successful mechanism that we have been um, enjoying through the Combined Forces Command uh, in safeguarding um, peace and freedom uh, on the Korean Peninsula should be respected and should be operated as long as the North Korean security threat um, present a very serious uh, concern for our national security. So uh, I would suggest that uh, perhaps by reassessing the security situation on the Korean Peninsula posed by the protracted challenge of nuclear uh, and ballistic missile proliferations, we need to reassess the situation and perhaps need to reschedule the uh, scheduled uh, transfer of the OPCON uh, military operation, uh, operational control in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, but I'm more concerned about the nuclear agreement, the, the revision of the nuclear agreement, the so-called one, two, three agreement. Um, the Korean position is that we need this revision um, because of the pressing need for securing our energy uh, to move on with the advanced economy in Korea. We need a stable supply of nuclear fuel. Either we need to buy or we need to reprocess uh, in Korea to run this peaceful nuclear power station. We also have environmental reason too that how to dispose the accumulating uh, nuclear waste coming out of the 23 nuclear power generations is a very important and serious issue to be resolved and also commercial and industrial necessities uh, and uh, demand uh, make us uh, think that this um, agreement which has, been, which has been here for four decades should be revised to create a mutually beneficial and more advanced and transparent agreement between the two sides. I know American concern coming from the non-proliferation principles uh, and I would tell those who have those concerns that Korea would like to um, present a symbol or champion model of peaceful, transparent nuclear energy user uh, in Asia uh, so that you know, we can move on to the uh, more uh, prosperous and peaceful nation uh, in the region. Uh, in other words, South Korea needs to present a complete contrast from North Korea uh, in approaching uh, this nuclear energy reprocessing. We, on a peaceful side, 
North Korea on a proliferation side. We are completely different, and I think that this issue should be resolved in the next two years uh, through more positive and constructive dialogue. Thank you. General? Yes. Just real quickly, uh, um, I think the thing that we need to really avoid, in addition to this, of course, OPCON issue, um, is the effort by North Korea and China and others to fuel the, and I'll use the word split, um, but certainly the complex relationship between Japan and South Korea. Uh, this is our Achilles heel with a strong allied um, relationship between Japan and South Korea. Th there will be no challenge to peace and security in Northeast Asia. However, if that split is exacerbated uh, and exploited, and if the Korean people and the Japanese people fall for it, uh, then you will see a destabilization that may run out of control. So while we're working very hard uh, to ensure that the direct alliance between the Republic of Korea and the United States remains strong and firm, we should all work hard uh, to find ways to mend old wounds, uh, bind relationships, and further an allied structure in that area of the world that sends a signal to Pyongyang, Beijing, and Moscow that the United States, Japan, and the Republic of Korea are allied together for peace and stability in Northeast Asia. And until that's done, there's going to be great risk uh, that um, uh, this problem of centuries, this centuries-old problem between these two nations will be exploited. Before I turn to, to the Secretary, we're going to open up the questions uh, after, right after uh, I give a chance to the Secretary and, and Dr. Hansen Ju. So if you have questions, please approach the microphone and, and be ready. Yes. I'll be very brief. I think uh, the great, one of the great dangers that we face is that you have a much younger generation uh, in the Republic of Korea today uh, who don't know about the sacrifices that were made and uh, see perhaps the American presence as being more of an occupying force uh, and not one that's necessary for the security of, uh, of the uh, Korean people, the South Korean people. There's also a danger in the United States from my perspective. I think that we're seeing younger people coming into positions of uh, political influence, whether in the Congress and the executive branch, but especially the Congress, uh, that really lack a lot of international experience who fail to see the consequences of the um, decisions that are being made in terms of the long-term security implications. And you have uh, a number of people uh, who are taking the position, uh, for example, we need to have nation building at home. Well, we do need to uh, invest in our infrastructure. We do need to invest in education and all the things that make this country strong. But the notion that somehow we can walk away from the world is pretty... Um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a folly because the world is never going to walk away from us. And yet there's this sentiment uh, that we have to try to uh, discourage that somehow those in the middle who have been really carved out of a political process, so you're on the right or you're on the left, and the so-called internationalists are disappearing. And that's one of the great dangers I see in our political system and also one uh, within the uh, Korean uh, peninsula is such that uh, the sacrifices that have been made in the past and what, uh, what um, South Korea has, how it has emerged from total devastation to what it is today, that the quest for peace will uh, be seen as something that is idealistically to be pursued at the expense of failing to understand the mistakes that have been made in the past. So uh, I think it's a political vulnerability that we both suffer from. Thank you, Mr. Dr. Han? Well, there, there are, of course, many challenges, but uh, I would like to uh, echo what Secretary Cohen just said about the domestic politics and sentiments. Um, in, in the case of Korea, I think there is uh, the element of what I would call nationalism, uh, and uh, in this case, uh, particularly expressed by, by the younger generation. And in the United States, um, it's the, the other side of internationalism, which uh, may be described as um, isolationism, which uh, has been, of course, uh, existent in, in the U.S. Uh, for centuries, but uh, 
uh, now uh, they may be uh, reappearing in, in earnest. And uh, so given the fact that um, the ROK U.S. alliance is a very peculiar one. Uh, if you think about it, uh, it is its primary uh, counterpart or uh, its primary uh, uh, object is uh, North Korea, which is, uh, in fact, a part of Korean nation. And so whenever uh, there is a reconciliation between North and South Korea, the, immediately there will be a, a doubt arising about uh, the usefulness uh, and rationale of uh, the U.S. alliance. And this, in fact, happened uh, during the uh, progressive regimes of uh, governments of uh, President Kim Dae-jung and President Noh Mui Hyun. Uh, it's uh, much easier uh, to manage the alliance when the South Korean government uh, is more uh, hardline uh, government than the United States, as it was the case during the Clinton administration period, uh, than it is when the U.S. takes a harder line vis-a-vis -vis North Korea than the South Korean uh, the government, as it was the case during the uh, first uh, term of the Bush administration, for example. And uh, so uh, this is going to uh, continue to be an important factor in, in the alliance. Thank you. We have many people want to ask questions. Why don't we do this? Why don't we just take all the questions and we'll give you quick round. So let's start with General Yamaguchi, please. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much uh, for all the panelists. Uh, my name is Noboru Yamaguchi. I used to spend uh, 30 plus years in uh, Japanese military and retired. And I'm teaching uh, history at the National Defense Academy. Um, just I want to, to make ju just one point as a Japanese. As a Japanese, uh, um, before congratulating 60th anniversary of uh, ROC-US alliance, uh, we, uh, I would like to very much like to thank uh, to Americans and uh, Koreans uh, for, uh, for working really hard and for your sacrifice and uh, efforts uh, to keep the peninsula safe, um, by which Japan, um, exceptionally in its history, enjoyed 60 years of uh, not worrying, uh, being worried about Western Front. Um, it is uh, actually exceptional uh, 60 years out of uh, maybe 18, 1,800 years of Japanese history. Thank you very much. That's it. Uh, if you would uh, speculate a little bit about likely future relations as they evolve and maybe change between China and North Korea and how those potential changes might affect uh, U.S. Korea relations. Uh, next in the back. Uh, Garrett Redfield, U.S. Korea Institute. My question is specifically for General Bell. With regards to U.S. Korea relations, one of the critical issues that doesn't really get reported on is the handling of U.S. crimes committed against uh, South Korean citizens, more specifically the raping of South Korean women. In more recent time, uh, newspapers in South Korea have reported a drastic increase in the reported rapings of South Korean women committed by U.S. soldiers. So with that in mind, I'd be curious to know during your tenure how you handled what kind of policies you implemented to combat the issue and what sort of future policy recommendations you have, uh, if that even includes uh, renegotiating the SOFA agreement. Okay. Uh, Larry, Dr. Nixie, and then the last question. I'm uh, Larry Nix from CSIS uh, to uh, General Bell. On the uh, OPCON uh, transfer, uh, we know there was a postponement from the 2012 uh, commitment to uh, separate the uh, commands and do away with the CFC. 
And I understand that uh, as an alternative to separating the commands in 2015, there is an idea that's being discussed about retaining the CFC, but placing the commanders, the commander of CFC and his deputy on a rotational basis between uh, South Korea, a South Korean commander and an American commander. In other words, they would switch positions every three years or so to replace the present situation in which CFC has a permanent American commander. Now, two questions in terms of the workability of that kind of plan. <clears throat> First of all, since World War I, the U.S. Army has had the so-called Pershing Rule, that it would never place itself under a foreign military commander. <clears throat> Given the longevity of the Pershing Rule, do you think the U.S. Army would be willing in Korea to place itself under a CFC Korean commander? And secondly, would a Korean commander of the CFC, again, on a rotational basis, be a workable structure given the fact that many of the U.S. military resources that would be committed to Korea in the case of a war really come from offshore, from Japan, from Guam, from Hawaii, from the U.S. West Coast? So would a CFC commanded by a Korean general really be able to work that system involving offshore U.S. forces? Thank you, Larry. Lastly, very quickly, please. Sure. Uh, my name is David Hong from the George Washington University. Uh, general Bell, you mentioned uh, that uh, you mentioned the, our generation's actions the moment and uh, the need to maintain U.S. troops um, in Korea. Um, to uh, a politically diverse uh, Korean public, what do you think the public diplomacy challenges are in terms of driving this, this message home? And um, what do you think that the U.S. government, as well as the Korean government, can do uh, on a PR front um, to, to emphasize this importance? Thing? Okay. Thank you very much. You get 30 seconds each. Uh, General Bell, you get so <laughs> I, many questions, you get quick. 45 seconds, actually. <laughs> <I got laughs> so that's it. Sorry. I'll, I'll be quick on this OPCON thing. I, I, first, I don't support OPCON transfer, so I, I almost hesitate to get into these technical issues. But I will just cover them briefly. The, the, there is a tremendous difference between the word and the doctrine of OPCON versus the word and the doctrine of command. The United States will never relinquish command of our troops, never has and never will. But we do routinely place ourselves under the operational control of other uh, commanders and other nations. We've, we've done it for years. What, what you have in that relationship is a right of refusal, where the commander, U.S., has the authority to say, I don't agree with this. We are, we're not going to do that. We're, we're not going to take that authority away from a U.S. commander ever. Remember today in Korea, under CFC, where are U.S. forces assigned? They're assigned in wartime to four-star Korean generals who make the operational decisions on how that force is employed. So we allow OPCON transition to happen today at the tactical and, and um, um, operational level. So, so the switch is not that dramatic. The United States will retain U.S. command but relinquish control uh, through dialogue. I mean, we will have commanders talk. Uh, so I've, I've never seen this as an issue. Uh, the United States is not going to do a United Nations deal uh, on itself here. So OPCON transfer is not a military doctrinal issue vis-a-vis -vis the Pershing rule or any risk of that. It does say someday that the South Koreans should have the opportunity to lead forces in combat, and we will support them in including in ground combat, and that we will agree to the operational plans. But I don't propose that at all right now because it's no longer an operational issue in my view. This is a strategic issue and a policy issue about commitment and resolution in our alliance. So I'd, I'm not in favor of OPCON transfer. 
a second quick uh, public three, diplomacy three seconds. challenge. You got big, you got big challenges. Uh, South Korea is uh, uh, on, a, on a nationalist track. God bless you for it. You ought to love your country. But you also have to recognize, in my view, the real threats that you face, an imminent threat in North Korea, regional threats down the road, and, uh, and look for alliances to assist you, and hopefully you can sell that to the Korean people. It gets back to the issues that I think have been raised here about younger generations not realizing the dangers of war as clearly as those per who perhaps have made those sacrifices. And this stuff about raping Korean women, I categorically reject that terminology to start with. U.S. troops almost to the last man and woman are well behaved, focused on uh, defending that country, uh, losing their lives if necessary, and spilling their blood. D yes, we do from time to time have a criminal element. And when that happens, in my case, and I know General Sharp and others have been very resolute in authorizing the Korean government to execute the provisions of the SOFA, which allow the Korean government to prosecute these criminals. We turn these folks over immediately to the South Korean government uh, for investigation and, cross and prosecution. Uh, so commanders make judgments. Uh, we made those judgments easily, but the, the notion that there's some kind of rape, pillage, and plunder by U.S. troops going on in the Republic of Korea, I find horribly offensive and reject it categorically. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Park. Well, I'll take uh, the question about China. Uh, I think China's basic position towards North Korea um, uh, remains unchanged. Uh, China still regards uh, peace and stability in the Korean Peninsula, in other words, status quo, as a highest priority. Um, and then the new denuclearization of North Korea would come next. And finally, dialogue and negotiations should be the way to solve these problems. Uh, but I think that increasingly Chinese leadership is conscious of the growing problems of protracted North Korean challenges, uh, which might work against its own national interest in the end. A nuclearized North Korea will catalyze a dangerous arm race in Northeast Asia uh, including Japan, South Korea, or maybe Taiwan. Uh, and that would be a direct security um, threat which will jeopardize, undermine the regional peace and stability. Uh, so I think we need to uh, engage in a strategic dialogue with China to point out that uh, in order to solve this nuclear problem, China should um, play its proactive role uh, in persuading North Korea in the first place uh, and the good sign is that China participated in the UN uh, sanctions imposed uh, on North Korea. Uh, and recently, a U.S.-China um, summit meeting in California um, apparently came out with a synchronized message from two leaders that um, North Korean nuclear uh, development is not in the uh, interest of the China is against the interests of China, and also uh, North Korea would not be recognized as a nuclear s uh, power uh, in, in the world. And I think this certainly uh, helps. And also, Korean president is going to meet with uh, Chinese president Xi Jinping in a matter of several days. And there, I think that President Park Geun-hye uh, would explain the trust-building process on the Korean peninsula and that North Korea should behave in a responsible way, respecting their obligations under international law. So I think that the trilateral policy coordination between South Korea, United States as allies, and also strategic dialogue with China uh, would create some positive behavior of North Korea because there is no better uh, way for them but to come back to a dialogue table. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Secretary. Just a quick word about uh, the public relations aspect of this. Uh, I think the key to it is um, memory, which is the word we used at the very beginning. Uh, the reason we're celebrating the 60 years is to have us remember the past, remember the sacrifice, remember the destruction, uh, be mindful of the progress that the younger generation has to be inculcated with the same values and virtues. And that means more education. It means more students studying in the United States. And by the way, uh, South Korea now has the third largest student population, uh, second only to China and India, in the United States, which is a very positive thing. But we need to have more student exchanges in the United States, understanding uh, the situation in Korea and the rest of the, uh, the region uh, as well. 
Uh, there's a quote taken from Eli Wiesel, a Holocaust survivor, and uh, uh, one small part of that phrase is he said, to forget the dead is akin to killing them a second time. And I would say that to forget the debt is, uh, is akin to incurring the debt a second time. So what we have to do is to make sure that we constantly remember our past, making sure that we don't repeat some of the mistakes we've made in the past, and then look forward and working together very closely together in the future. And as far as the operational command is concerned, uh, that, as I understand it, the OPCOM was always conditional. Namely, it depended upon the circumstances uh, that existed in terms of capability. And that's not something that's fixed in stone, but rather is open uh, to extension for however long is necessary. But back to the education is going to our young people and reminding them of what has taken place in the past and how we move forward. Thank you very much. Dr. Hunt? Yeah, just one quick comment on the issue of China factor on U.S. ROK alliance. I don't really see any possibility, even in the long run, that um, the U.S.-China relations or US, uh, South Korea-China relations will, have, uh, will affect uh, the alliance in any fundamental way, uh, even though uh, China may have uh, some views on uh, some issue aspects, uh, such as uh, missile defense, U.S. Uh, nuclear uh, extended uh, deterrence uh, or uh, where the U.S. troops are stationed uh, in the Korean Peninsula and so on. Uh, so uh, e even as uh, the U.S.-China relations evolve and uh, South Korea-China relations evolve, uh, I don't think it will uh, fundamentally affect uh, the alliance itself. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry the time is so short again, but uh, please join me in thanking this uh, wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.